Hello and welcome to the Musical Instrument Investigator. Today we are on the website of uh, Christie's Auctioneers, the uh, world famous auction house, uh, and we've got something interesting to share with you. So a couple of days ago, um, Christie's announced that they were uh, going to sell um, an Antonio Stradivari violin, the so-called Hellier um, violin, on the 7th of July 2022. So um, yeah, another Strad coming up for auction in 2022. It's a bit of a mad year. There must be something in the water. So we just saw recently uh, Del Gizu, uh went uh, for sale at uh, a French auction, Agutz, and it sold for 3.3 million euros, which a lot of people were very surprised about because that was very low. Uh, and we looked the other day to see that um, Teresio uh, are selling the ex Seidel, the so-called Da Vinci uh, Strad. And now that Da Vinci Strad currently has bids of $8 million, which was the opening bid, and it's due to finish tomorrow. I think by the time that this um, particular video uploads, um, it will probably be kind of a bit under kind of 24 hours or definitely under 24 hours, maybe 15 hours or so. Um, until that auction finishes it'll be really really interesting to see what happens but um this particular strad um is basically the finest example of like an inlaid um strad that there is so this this is really going to be quite an interesting uh, one for sure so what we're going to do uh, as we've done with the del jazu and the other um stradivari violin we're going to have a look at through the press release the info that they have some of the actual auction bits aren't up yet um, but I thought we'd get this in early while it's still kind of fresh. Um, and then we're going to have a quick look at the Kojo archive entry for this uh, one because this is kind of open. Um, well, actually, it's probably this is kind of through my account, but we'll we'll have a look at this and hopefully we don't get in trouble uh, too much. Uh, and we're also going to read um, an article uh, by Roger Hargrave, who's a like... Uh, kind of internationally regarded violin maker and researcher and he had this article about the Hellier uh, from a few years ago I think from 1987 and we're just going to read through that and just see um, so yeah we're just going to kind of summarize things a little bit and uh, hopefully uh, that's of, uh, of interest to everyone um, so yeah enough of me ranting already I'm just quite uh, surprised really with uh, all of these uh, high level instruments kind of going up for auction but anyway uh let's get on with it so like i said this is fresh this is from two days ago uh this was released a press release so antonio stradivari's finest inlaid violin the hellier stradivarius violin new proportions that became the blueprint of future violin models enriching the tone and having a profound effect on future centuries of music and generations of violin makers um this is leading their exceptional sale in london on the 7th of july 2022 uh, during classic week so here we can see uh, an image of the hellier violin here it's kind of ornate purfling and kind of this uh detail uh work on the scroll and i think potentially on the on the ribs we'll see hopefully a bit more of that when we look at the Teresio uh kind of listing so london the hellier stradivarius 1679 is the finest inlaid violin ever by the world-renowned genius craftsman antonio stradivari and one of the finest stradivarius instruments in existence the estimate is six to nine million an extremely rare and important example of stradivari's work this masterpiece is the top lot of the exceptional sale on the 7th of july and a highlight with classic week london the Hellier exhibits new proportions that became the blueprint of future violin models, enriching the tone and having a profound effect on future centuries of music and future generations of violin makers. It will be on view at Christie's London in the Art of Literature auction highlights exhibition, which will run from the 6th to the 15th of June, ahead of being part of the pre-sale exhibition for the exceptional, exceptional sale from the 2nd to the 7th of July. Amjad Ralph, head of the Exceptional Sale, International Head of Masterpiece and Private Sales, Christie's Decorative Arts, commented, that's a good title, Christie's is honoured to be offering the Hellier Violin, a rare masterpiece executed circa 1679, by the genius craftsman Antonio Stradivari, which is without doubt his finest inlaid violin. 
previously in the greatest collections of musical instruments uh, and latterly on loan to the Smithsonian Museum, this remarkable lot represents the market with a once in a lifetime opportunity that exemplifies the best of the best works that are synonymous with the exceptional sale. Uh, I have to say this is, is an extremely rare opportunity um, that this particular violin is come on sale. Very, very interesting violin. Uh, Florian Leonhardt, a world famous kind of expert and dealer. Uh, and also the Christie's consultant, London commented, having handled countless Stradivaris, including some of the finest examples, this is without a doubt one of the most exciting, beautiful and impressive instrument in existence. The warmth and personality that an instrument of this calibre exudes inspires a sense of youthful excitement in anyone fortunate enough to hold it in one's hands. This violin epitomises more than most the vision of Stradivari's ability to develop things forward, a reason why he deserves his place in the zenith as the unsurpassed violin maker of all time. Interesting. Prize since creation to the present day. Stradivari was thought to have refused to sell the instrument for 55 years until 1734 in a sale for £40 to Sir Samuel Hellier of Warmbourne, England, uh, as recorded in the 1880s. Although it is now believed that it may have entered the Hellier family sometime earlier, the 1719 will of John Hellier of Westminster bequeathed two Cremona violins to his nephew Samuel Hellier, father of Sir Samuel Hellier. The violin remained in the Hellier family for almost two centuries. This uh, hesitancy to part with the violin has been seen from all subsequent distinguished owners from Henry E. Morris, the newspaper tycoon and director of the Shanghai Daily News, to American collector Mr. Henry Hottinger, uh, a founder and member of the firm of investment bankers who amassed one of the best known collections of rare violins of the mid 20th century. The instrument has been housed in both the Smithsonian Institute and the Museo Civico in Cremona. Uh, so Antonio Stradivari, 1644 to 1737. Uh, is the most famous and revered Italian violin maker whose approximately 500 surviving violins are widely regarded as the finest and most valuable ever made. Stradivari's supreme level of craftsmanship coupled with his uh, inexhaustible artistic creativity resulted in instruments to which all subsequent makers have aspired and which have been sought after by the leading musicians of each generation. New proportions have become the blueprint of future violins. Made towards the beginning of Stradivari's career, the 1679 Hellier Stradivarius was the first of his violins to evolve significantly from the strict proportions of the Amatis period, 1660-1690, scaled up in a fashion that would form the blueprint for future violin models. Proportions that were not subsequently uh, surpassed, it was an evolution that enriched the tone and would have a profound effect on several centuries of music and future generations of violin makers. Uh, ingenious in conception and meticulous in execution. From the superior choice of wood to the exquisite ivory inlays, the Hellier is ingenious in conception and meticulous in execution. Stradivari's uh, 1679 Hellier is an interesting violin for a huge variety of reasons. Aside from the incredible inlay work, uh, which the surviving drawings made in Antonio's hand suggest he did himself, the varnish technique he employs shows his first real attempt to improve on the method great Cremonese maker Niccolo Amati had developed. The incredibly fine work on the scroll, the increased volume of the violin and the beautiful F-holes -hole, F all attest to Stradivari advancing existing practices. Niccolo Amati's influence can be seen in the head's perfectly symmetrical proportions the sweeping gracefulness of the peg box and the scroll small and deeply turned volutions. However, there is an overall bolder momentum to the outline of this violin, and the position and design of the F hole surpass any instrument that came before. The rich, intensely orange uh, yellow varnish atop a thin, almost transparent golden ground layer also demonstrates some deviation from Stradivari's Amatis style. Between the two rows of purfling, the Hellier features a procession of nearly 500 processions. Uh, precious gems. Beginning at the corners, carefully sculpted ivory circles chasse alternatively um, with delicately engraved ivory diamonds displaying Stradivari's extraordinary skill in freehand inlaying. This is complemented by the ornately florid silhouettes of flowers and vines etched into the wood and filled in with ebony mastic which creep their way around the ribs of the violin in the peg box. The art of decorating instruments in such a way may have its roots in plucked stringed instruments such as lutes, 
The designs were first drawn on paper before being transposed to the wood and Stradivari's original drawings and tools can be seen at the Museo del Violino in Cremona. Of the roughly 1,100 instruments Stradivari made over the course of his career, only around a dozen are embellished with decoration and this specimen is regarded by the Smithsonian craters as the best preserved extant, extant example. Royal and uh, Aristocratic Collections so renowned was Stradivari and so desired are his instruments that his instruments, particularly the very rare decorated examples, have been precious family heirlooms to the major courts, earls, dukes and royal households of Europe, arguably most notable of the Italian families in the Medici family of Florence, whose dedication to fine art led them to commission instruments from Stradivari, but in particular a complete quartet which exists today in an almost untouched state of preservation, not only noble families, but indeed many royal families of Europe have been in possession of Stradivari's instruments, with the 1708 Empress Katerina of Russia, which was owned by Catherine the Great, Tsarina of Russia, uh, during the late 1700s. Other examples of note include the Earl, the Early of Plymouth, the Duke of uh, Cambridge, the Duke of Marlborough, Royal Palace of Madrid, and King Ludwig II of Bavaria. Uh, favoured by soloists throughout history. Most of the great soloists in history favoured Stradivari's and so many of the great names used Stradivari's. Niccolo Paganini, one of the greatest violinists of all time, owned and played on a selection of the finest violins ever made. Among these, Nico Niccolo had a number of Stradivari violins that ranged the whole creative output of Stradivari. This included the Paganini Paganini de Sainte, 1680, Lebrun, 1712, Hubei, 1726, and the Paganini, uh, Comte Cosi de uh, Salabu, 1727. The Soil, 1740, Stradivarius is widely considered one of the finest golden periods of violins and was acquired by Yehudi Menuhin in 1950, which was subsequently sold to Itzhak Perlman in 1986. Andrew Rio famously purchased his 1667 Stradivarius de Captain Seville, um, or Saville, in fact, which he purchased in forms uh, almost exclusively on. Other fav famous musicians include, include those such as Joseph Jacquim, uh, Yasser Heifetz, David Ostrak, uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Dupree, etc. Of the living soloists that use them are uh, and Sophie Mutter, uh, Leonidas Karakos, uh, Maxim Vengerov, Joshua Bell, Stephen Isselis, and Yo Yo Ma. I'm just struggling a bit on the uh, pronunciations there. As you know, I'm pretty bad at pronouncing people's names. So, anyway, that's the press release press release from Christie's uh, about the sale of this violin on the 7th of July. So, not too long to go, uh, just under uh, a month now. Uh, so what I think we'll do now is we'll just kind of have a quick look at uh, the Teresio uh, listing for uh, for this particular violin. So I'm just going to quickly show this from the um, Cosio archive um, and just to, to show you what you get. So Antonio Stradivari, Corona 1679, the Helier one piece uh, back of broad curl, top of fine grain opening slightly towards the flank, scroll of wood similar to the back. Ribs of wood similar to the back but narrower curl, length of the back 35.6, up about 16.95, middle about 11.2, lower about 21. There are uh, nine additional images that we can't see here. Uh, if we have a look at this kind of full size quickly, uh, I don't want to kind of get in trouble too much with the Teresio gods for showing this because it will be up later uh, when this is, has a proper auction listing but I just thought I'd show it for now so you can see it's really interesting kind of vine uh detail here really really quite fascinating i wonder if we'll get to see it's in black and white but we can see here parts of the the ribs and the details on that i, mean, I think most of these images are fairly wide widely spread already but uh it's definitely uh, an interesting instrument uh, for sure so i think that's it um, I think um, we can read uh, a little bit of this if we have a look at the provenance here. Um, 1734, Sir Samuel Hellier of Wombourne, Sir Edward Hellier, 1872, Colonel Shaw Hellier, 1875-1885, George Compton, 1885-1890, to 
Charles James Oldham, 1890-1910, Colonel Shaw Hellier, 1910-1912, W.E. Hills and Sons, from 1912, Hammer & Co. until 1925, Oscar Bondi, 1925-1932, W.E. Hills and Sons, from 1932, H.E. Morris, in 1957, Rembert Wurlitzer, 1957-1965, Henry Hottinger, 1965-1979, Rembert Wurlitzer again, from 1979, Thomas M. Roberts, 1993, Alfredo Heligua, and from 1998, the current owner, who I believe has actually kind of passed away, uh, which is why it's being sold. Uh, so there was, was a Wurlitzer uh, certificate from 1957, uh, a letter, a letter from Hills and Sons, another certificate from Hills 1957, and Macold Rare Violins certificate from 1998. So that's interesting. A uh, whole load of references that you can kind of see on that as well. Um, I think there's a few kind of uh, other notes here. Um, as regards the dimensions, a difference from any other violin seen by us dated before 1684 to 85, these proportions were in fact never at any later period exceeded. Thus, we see that Stadivari was already contemplating that change of proportions to which he was more generally to give effect after 1685. The perfect symmetry of the head and the uh, position and admirable design and cutting of the F holes, also in advance of his contemporaneous. Uh, work known to us. Uh, on the other hand, the model, heavy edge and small purfling are thoroughly characteristic of his early work and the whole presents a heaviness and solidity of construction such as we may almost venture to say uh, borders on clumsiness. We may here accidentally remark that this violin shows that Stradivari occasionally enjoyed rich patronage previous to 1680 uh, for he received no ordinary remuneration for the making of such an instrument. So that's from there hill book antonio stradivari in his life and work um then the helier uh, and the instrument known as the spanish stradivari dated 1679 1687 respectively have backs of broad curl in one piece the latter is exceptionally handsome and both of wood of foreign i.e non-italian growth um it's another bit from the hill uh, book there uh, remarkable for its somewhat unusually large proportions and general heaviness of structure that's from uh, the Henley book. One of 10 surviving inlaid instruments by Stradivari. That's a Charles Beer commentary there. On loan to Vienna's uh, Kunsthistorische Museum, 2004 to 2009. That's uh, from the Strad. Uh, instrument number 85 in the South Kensington Special Exhibit of 1872 there, apparently. Uh, instrument number 1081 in the Special Loan exhi Exhibition at the Fishmongers Hall in 1904. Uh, and it was on loan to the Museo del uh, Violino in Cremona since 2009. And obviously it's been at the Smithsonian as well. Um, it is possible to trace the history of the Helier back almost as far as Stradivari's famous workshop. In fact, several sources, including the Hills, endorse the account that the Englishman Sir Samuel Helier of Wombourne, uh, a passionate collector of musical instruments and books on music, had bought the instrument directly from Stradivari in Cremona in 1734. Apparently, in a letter to Sir Samuel uh, Sir Samuel Stradivari himself referred to the price the gentleman paid for the instrument, the princely sum of forty pounds. The letter was unfortunately lost sometime around the end of the nineteenth century. Um, so there you go. That's uh, some other research uh, there about Stradivari. So yeah, there we go. There's a bit of information on uh, on the from the Teresio website and the Kojo archive that you can subscribe to. Uh, it is does. Uh, cost a, a fee like a yearly fee but it's definitely worth it because you get to see lots of amazing stuff so i definitely recommend kind of checking it out it's uh it's very cool this is not a sponsored ad but as i showed some information from it i think it's only right that i do kind of acknowledge it and uh, obviously i'll put a link in the description uh, so moving on i think let's uh read uh, roger hargraves uh, article this is the next thing for us to look at so now we're going to have a look at an article by Roger Hargrave regarding the Helier Strad. This is actually up on his website, so you can read it for free. So I'll put a link in the description. Uh, as I said a bit earlier, Roger Hargrave, very, very respected maker, very fine maker, very respected uh, researcher. Uh, so this is definitely a kind of uh, a good article. It's from 1987, but I still think it's kind of good to 
read over him. So this is uh, Roger Hargrave discusses the most famous of Stradivari's decorated instruments, photograph Stuart Pollens, research assistant Judy Reed, technical assistant Gary Sturm from the Smithsonian Inst uh, Institute. Uh, most modern violin makers prefer to believe that the violin is so pure in its conception that it simply does not require the vulgarity of added ornamentation, whilst there may indeed be some just justification for this 20th century uh, functionalist idealism. It is certainly not in keeping with the Baroque environment uh, within which the violin was to develop and reach its maturity. Before, during and even after the classical period of violin making in Italy circa 1550 to 1750, an impressively large number of musical instruments were decorated. Throughout Europe, gambas, sitins, kettle drums, organs, recorders, guitars, trumpets, spinets, harpsichords, clavichords, flutes, lutes and many more obscure instruments besides were being carved, gilded, inlaid, embossed, uh, chased or chassed and painted to a point where the original function of the instrument became an almost secondary consideration. It is however quite likely and certainly worth considering that such elaborately um, decorated instruments, mainly prepared for a wealthy clientele, would have had far better chances of survival than those simply made from the local for the mo local street musician. Not surprisingly, many of the great Cremonese makers did choose to decorate at least some of their production. The majority of surviving instruments of Andrea Amati, circa 1550-1581-2, to the first known Cremonese violin maker, are decorated. Andrea's designs were usually quite elaborate, generally taking the form of a dedication to some member of the uh, aristocracy. Though tastefully and skillfully executed, the painting and gilding often covered the back ribs and head almost entirely. However, apart from the usual uh, single string of purfling around the edge, any uh, elaborate inlay work appears to have been confined to the fingerboards and tail pieces. In spite of this extreme uh, decoration, the simple uh, nobility of these ancient instruments, their superb craftsmanship and perhaps the patina of the centuries has made them totally acceptable to 20th century tastes. Gasparo de Salo, Giovanni Paolo Magini and many other anonymous Brescian makers also occasionally pulled out the stops. They produced some very intricate, if not always well finished, purfling designs on the backs and bellies of their instruments. Occasionally Brescian instruments were also painted with heraldic and other devices. I have seen two violins by Niccolò Amati, both of which are double purfled. Small areas of the ribs, the plates, the neck and the whole of the head have been inlaid using a black filler in a way strongly resembling both the style and method which Stradivari was later to develop. In a different way, these works of Niccolò seem to have influenced members of the Guarneri family who used similar fleur-de-lis devices and double purfling. A few other Italian makers extended the decorative use of inlay and paintwork on their instruments, but by the 18th century the practice was like the Brock period itself, largely dying out. There are 10 known surviving decorated instruments by Stradivari. This number is made up of 8 violins, 1 viola and 1 cello. The last of the decorated violins made in 1722, known as the Rode, does not have inlay work on the head and ribs. Instead, like the surviving viola and cello, of the Spanish Quartet, the designs are only delicately painted on. Of the remaining seven completely inlaid instruments, I have examined four very carefully. They are as follows. The uh, Cipriani Potter, 1683, which is housed in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. The Ole Bull, 1687, which is one of the two generally magnificent instruments in the Axelrod Quartet. The Grafula, uh, 1709, so named because of the unusual design of the inlaid work, which include uh, Grafuls and several spotted hunting dogs, also in the Axelrod Quartet, and finally the Hellier, which is represented here. The history of the Hellier is well documented. It's one of the few instruments which can be traced back directly to Stradivari's workshop. It was brought to England by Sir Edward Hellier in 1734, and is obviously named after him. The following are excerpts from papers which are not in general circulation but which will help the reader to build a better picture of the violin's history. I've also included a section of uh, Boring's How Many Strads since its scarcity may prohibit many people from seeing it for themselves. There is an accompanying letter to the certificate of W.E. Hills and Sons dated 21st of January 1957 uh, by Hill of special interest. In part one, quote, the instrument derives its name from the Hellier family whose possession it first recorded uh, in the um, 18th century. It was brought to the country by Sir Samuel Hellier, who is said to have purchased it from the great make himself. 
The violin remained in possession of the Hellier family until about 1880 when it was sold by Colonel Shaw Hellier. It is one of the few instruments whose complete history from making to present day is known. We have always uh, greatly admired these inlaid instruments of which 10 only are known to exist. The design of the ornamentation being of such a uh, chaste beauty and so thoroughly in keeping with the maker's high standard of craftsmanship, they were the object of his special care and we learn from the writings of the old priest Arisi who used to frequent the master's workshop and who in referring to him in the year 1720 writes as follows his, his fame is unequalled as a maker of instruments of the finest qualities and has made many of the extraordinary beauty uh, ornamented with small figures, flowers, fruits, arabesques and gracefully inlaid um, fanciful ornaments in all perfect drawing uh, which he sometimes paints in black or inlays with ebony and ivory, all of which are executed with the greatest skill, rendering them worthy of the exalted uh, personage to whom they are intended to be presented. Such instruments will stand out against the masterpieces of the makers, and the Hellier, which is in a remarkable fresh state, never having been overplayed, is from a tonal point of view one of the uh, forest uh, Stradivaris in existence. I wonder if that's meant to say finest. That's... Uh, Wurlitzer, the Hottinger uh, collection there. The famous Hellier violin has been uh, variously recorded as a work of 1679. is one of the few specimens which are traced directly to Stradivari himself, as Sir Edward Hellier of Warmborn, Staffordshire, England, bought it from him in 1734 at Cremona, three years before the death of the master. Hellier is said to have paid a sum at approximately $200 in today's equivalent. That at the time was perhaps a uh, goodly price to pay, yet how utterly inadequate at this age. The violin remained in the Hellier family throughout several generations. It was loaned for exhibition at South Kensington in 1872 by Captain T.B. Shaw Hellier, being number 85 for the exhibits. In 1875 it passed from the Hellier family to George Crompton and by him was exhibited in 1885 again at South Kensington. The violin then passed to a new owner, Charles Oldham, a prominent eye specialist of London, who is recorded in the annals of violin lovers as having the unique distinction of possessing at one time an entire quartet of ornamented strads. Oldham's wish was to leave his collection to the British Museum. It was, however, not accepted, and this instrument left English possession, um, according by Hammer & Co of Stuttgart, in whose book it appears illustrated in three views. The violin is also illustrated in colour plates in the Hipkins and Gibb work, two years younger than the Sunrise, the Hellier, second of the ornamented types of violins, shows bolder lines and more massive build, a manifestation of Stradivari's growing urge to depart from Amati's teachings, although then still an employee in his shop. Uh, boring how many strads, uh, 367. Uh, Antonio Stradivari was the indisputably the greatest violin maker of all time and in every respect the Hellier is one of his personal masterpieces. The unique and almost unbelievable quality of this and indeed all of Stradivari's inlaid violins is proved to be his ability to apply an astonishing amount of decorative inlay with a lightness and finesse uh, in which no way disturbs the harmony of the violin's natural form. Indeed the decoration generally enhances the simple beauty of the instrument's lines. In many ways a Hellier can claim to be an absolutely unique violin. In 1679 Antonio was slowly, uh, almost painfully slowly moving away from the influence of Niccolo Amati, although quite definitely inspired by Niccolo, not least in its decoration in the Hellier, we are given a vision of the shape of things to come. The modelling of the Hellier was an evolutionary step of tremendous vigour, but strangely one destined not to be repeated for several years. Stradivari was not a struggling, pushy achiever in the modern sense. His emancipation was a slow process and his development a composed and carefully catalogued affair which was fortunately continued until the end of his extraordinary uh, long life. We do not know if this instrument was a special commission, perhaps later cancelled or merely a showpiece in which Stradivari could display his ta talent to prospective customers. Either way, the instrument was to remain in Stradivari's workshop for a further 60 years. The hours involved in building such a violin did not come cheaply and it is therefore understandable that Stradivari was also extremely careful in his choice of materials. 
The two-piece belly wood is of magnificently fine growth, opening only very slightly in the flanks. It is straight-grained and quarter-sawn, and very typical of the wood used by Stradivari in this early period. Although Stradivari seems to have rejected such exceptionally fine belly wood in the later periods, this decision may have been um, dictated by a shortfall in his supply rather than for acoustical or other reasons. The back wood is of finely grown imported wood, again cut exactly in the quarter. The bold wide flame runs across and slightly downwards from left to right. The intensity of the flame has created a pronounced uh, corrugated effect which is clearly visible when the back is viewed against a raking light. Although the ribs are similar to the back, they are of even finer growth and the flames are slightly tighter with a pronounced slope of almost 60 uh, degrees. Normally the flame uh, deflection on the Stradivarius ribs remains the same all the way around the instrument. On the Helier, however, the flames of the right hand centre rib runs in the opposite direction. Curiously, this feature can be seen on the other inlaid violins, as the usual top rib would have been made from a single piece before being cut uh, when the neck was modernised. Uh, the wood for the head has been very cleverly chosen, again cut in the quarter and of extremely fine growth. The flame, despite matching the ribs perfectly, is also of a very shallow curl. Such a shallow curl would obviously have been helpful during the uh, carving and inlaying process. The head is a typical specimen of Stradivari's early work and in that respect retains much of the Amati influence. It is perfect in symmetry and proportions, perhaps one of the most beautifully worked heads of the whole classical period. Only the Amatis ever match this kind of elegance, and Stradivari seldom uh, produced such delicate work in his later periods. Later heads have uh, possessed more vitality, more forcefulness and more maturity, but they never again possess this kind of sensitivity. The work is of course exceptionally clean, although as always some small traces of the gouge can still be seen on the uh, vertical surfaces of the turns, especially around the small eyes which seems to pass like a dowel from one side of the scroll through to the other. Viewed from the side, the Amati influence can be seen in the sweep of the peg box and the smaller than later turn to the scroll itself and the volutes remain fairly uh, shallow, becoming only slightly deeper as they spiral in towards the eye. The volutes end in stings rather than the more usual commas. The inlaying work uh, flowing around the peg box and into the volutes runs almost up into the stings of the eyes and finishes with four tiny dots on each side. The end of the eyes have been decorated with an extremely delicate uh, flower uh, design cut simply with a narrow U-shaped gouge. Uh, viewed from the back, the peg box has a distinctly uh, amatise taper running through the chin to the top of the head. The extra width of the back of the box on a level with the throat, which is so much a trademark of Stradivari's later heads, had not yet been developed. Um, the chin itself is quite wide, helping to accentuate the taper. The peg box is generously enough inside. Um, the flutings running up the back and over the top of the scroll are only slightly shallower than usual. They retain the normal flat bottom curve which generally becomes more rounded in form as it passes over the top and under the front. The central spline between the two flutes has been in a strip of purfling which runs impossibly far underneath the front of the scroll. There are naturally enough uh, none of the usual pinpricks visible in the spline. This strip of purfling was not used on every inlined head. The graffula, uh, for example, has a single back line only. The chamfer, like the head, is delicate and appears not to have been picked out in black. Perhaps Stradivari felt to do so would have made this particular, particular head too heavy. Again, this was not always the case as proved in the graffula. Very interesting, that. Uh, the inlaid work on the head and ribs of staggering fluidity. The intensity of the blacks is perfectly counterbalanced by the finely spun quality of the lines. The Helier is probably the most delicately inlaid of the violins which I've seen, and judging from photographs, possibly the most delicate of all. The head in particular is finished with a lightness of touch which almost defies the imagination. It would be fruitless for me to describe the inlaid work in more detail. The photographs speak for themselves. I will make only one final comment as to the working of the inlay. The work on both the head and the ribs is relatively deeply etched as can be clearly seen where small pieces of filler have been chipped away. I would guess up to 1mm more in depth on the head and 0.5 to 0.75mm at least on the ribs. In their book, Antonio Stradivari, His Life and Works, the hill suggests that parchment was used on the back of the ribs to strengthen them. If any such material was used on the Helier, it has since been removed. 
The outline of the helia is one of the most interesting features. It measures 358 millimeters over the arching, 14 uh, inches. It is also remarkably wide. These measurements were only used again by Stodavar in the mid um, certainty uh, when both the length and the width are considered together, they were never really exceeded, although similar proportions occur again at the end of the golden period in the 1720s. Although the helier is marginally shorter than the so-called long pattern violins of the 1690s, it is considerably wider in the body. Furthermore, the helier has a flatness to the top and bottom of the outline, which the long pattern instruments do not have, and which certainly puts extra meat into the upper and lower bouts. The middle bouts also have the appearance of being wider, perhaps because of the straightness of the middle section combined with the way in which the top corners hook sharply back. The hooking of the corners and the correspondingly tighter curve of the ribs are typical of this early period. The edgework and corners are finished boldly. Perhaps Stradivari considered this necessary in order to balance the extra width of the purpling inlays, possibly because of the slightly heavier edge work there is some suggestion of the 1685 period about the upper corners generally the outline viewed on its own is out of character for the period the arching also shows an advance in Stradivari's thinking there is only a slight scooping in the edges to accommodate the necessary uh, necessarily wider purfling channel otherwise the arching is quite full in the flanks the sound holes are an abrupt return to the 1670s they are a perfect match for the head keenly cut with desperately narrow gaps to the tips of the wings. They are refined rather than imposing and certainly go well with the fine belly wood which this type of hole is so often associated. The flutings in the wings are shallower than normal but well defined. They run up alongside the body of the holes to create a slight eyebrow effect above the top outside curves. The circles have clearly been drilled and the top circles in particular are smaller than in Stradivari's later sound holes. The bodies of the holes, typically narrow, are almost cut at right angles to the plate. The nicks are elegantly finished and not over large. The inlay work of both the belly and the back consists of two parallel strips of purpling, each made up from three pieces in the normal way. Between these strips set into the black background, tiny ivory circles and diamonds alternate with one another around the edge work. The purpling strips are thin, perhaps more so than normal, although Stradivari's early purpling was relatively narrow. The strips come together at the corners to form beautiful mitres on both the inside and outside. An ivory circle is set into each corner between the mitres. The ivory circle, not always exactly round, vary between 2 to 2.5 mm in diameter. The diamonds are also not always symmetrical, ranging from 5 to 6 mm in length and 1.75 to 2 mm in width. There are 240 circles and diamonds set into the back alone and a similar number in the belly. The black fillet into which the ivory pieces are set is the same as that which makes up the inlay and the head and, and ribs. The work is extremely clean. There's no sign of the rasp marks which are scratched into the ivories on the Cipriani Potter violin in the Ashmolean. In fact, there are no visible tool marks anywhere in the instrument with the exception of those already mentioned on the head. Apart from some minor repair work, the general condition of this violin is excellent. Prominent edges and corners are hardly worn. The varnish is a rich orange yellow colour over a golden ground, thin and highly transparent. The whole instrument is extraordinarily clean and fresh looking. In particular, the ground where varnish is missing is clean. This in itself is a sure sign of a fine violin. Despite my reference to different periods and styles, the violin is well balanced. Nothing is too heavy or overworked, including the fine old hill fittings. This is without question one of the world's finest violins and may even be considered by Stradivari himself to be his masterpiece. Well, that's definitely quite uh, quite an endorsement uh, for sure. So you can definitely see that this is a very important uh, violin for sure. I think that this particular article is perhaps kind of uh, in conjunction with a kind of Hellier Strad poster. Um, or something like that so he's kind of here um roger hargrave is talking about his drawing and the f holes include some slight wear uh and they're kind of talking about kind of uh some of sarconi's measurements here so it says my drawing of the f hole includes some slight wear to the outside line the th thickness of the plates and the ribs were not taken and i must refer the reader to sarconi's sick thing sick thickness and guides re reproduced here as usual because of the printing process the outline is actually within one millimeter over the length 
the head and F hole drawings on which the measurements are mounted are only facsimiles. It may be noted that the cross archings do not always correspond to the long archings if the same baseline is used. This is because these archings were taken whilst the instrument was closed and some natural twisting and warping of the plates and ribs has taken place. So this is in relation to the kind of probably the Strad poster and other drawings. So bibliography, uh, Sarconi's book about secrets of Stradivari, loan exhibition of stringed instruments and bows in the USA 1966, uh, Friedelin Hammer, Masterworks of Italian uh, Makers, Antonio Stradivario, The Hill Book, AJ Hipkins, Musical Instruments, Historic, Rare and uh, Unique, Classical Boasting Instruments from the Smithsonian Institute from Gacken. Um, just a bit here, total numbers of diamonds and circles on the Helier, back only uh, 240, back up abouts including corner circles, 42 circles, 41 diamonds, middle bout right excluding corner circles, 14 circles, 15 diamonds, middle bout left excluding corner circles, 13 circles, 14 diamonds, lower bouts including corner circles, 51 circles, 50 diamonds. And here you can see a whole load of measurements of which I'm not gonna read out. So that's a really, really interesting article by Roger Hargrave there that I'll put in, that I'll link in, uh, which gives you a good overview of the Helier. Um, so there we have it. We have the press release from Christie's about the auction. We have a little bit more information on provenance and a few other kind of pictures there of the of the Helier from Teresia. I'm sure if you look kind of online, you'll be able to find, um, you know, all of this information uh, fairly easy to, to come across. Uh, and obviously we have this really amazing um, Roger Hargrave article. So all of which I'll... Uh, I'll put a link into the uh, description uh, for you to look if you uh, if you want to. Just as an additional note, I just thought I'd show this kind of Google Arts and Cultures page, which uh, shows you some other pictures that uh, weren't uh, in colour on the uh, on the Teresio site. So you can see, obviously, there's a picture on the main Christie's article here of the back. Uh, but what might be interesting to to some people is the um, oh we're going into something different there uh, is the uh, sides so here you can kind of see a bit more how that how fine that work is at the side really really is quite incredible and then we can also see this really amazing kind of close up of the scroll detail so beautiful so beautifully done uh, so yeah that's really interesting so I thought I'd just add this and I'll put a link in the description to to this as well and th there are probably lots of other places that you can see photos of this as well in more detail but I just thought this was an easy one to to have a look at uh, so yeah this is um, uh, kind of slightly longer than I expected but a video about the Helier Strad which is uh, due to be sold at Christie's Auction House in London on the 7th of July 2022. So thanks a lot for bearing with me and watching and uh, until next time, uh, take it easy. Ciao. Many thanks for tuning in to the Musical Instrument Investigator. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please like, uh, subscribe and turn on notifications and watch out for the next video coming soon.